Hi, folks. Welcome. We're so happy to have you here. I see we're getting a lot of people joining all at once. We're just really excited. We're going to give people a little bit more time to join in, and then we'll kick things off. Hi, folks. Happy Monday. I see we've still got some people trickling in, so I'm going to give it a few more minutes. But thank you all so much for joining us today. We are so excited for this event that we've got. Can't wait to get started. Okay, now that we've given it a few minutes, thank you all so much for joining us today. My name is Hannah Reed, and I am the Outreach Coordinator at Evergreen Action. I'm excited to introduce you to our speakers today who are going to talk about the new Environmental and Climate Justice Community Change Grants from the EPA, a historic funding opportunity brought to us by the Inflation Reduction Act, which will invest $2 billion in grants and technical assistance for historically disadvantaged communities. We're going to hear a message from Rep. Nanette Berrigan, who was a crucial champion in Congress for these grants, get an overview from the EPA, and then dive further in with two experts who can help us all better understand how communities can use this pool of money to reduce pollution, increase community resilience, and build capacity to advance environmental and climate justice. We'll be taking questions at the end, so please do drop your questions into the Q&A box as we go, and we'll get to as many of them as we can. But first, let's get started with some introductions. So we're going to kick things off hearing a message from Representative Nanette Berrigan, who represents California's 44th Congressional District. She is the youngest of 11 children raised in Harbor City in Los Angeles by immigrant parents from Mexico and knows firsthand the challenges, by, challenges faced by environmental justice communities. Since joining Congress in 2016, Rep. Berrigan has served as a voice for those communities on the front lines of climate and environmental injustice. She is the chair of the Congressional Hispanic Caucus and serves on the House Energy and Commerce Committee. Her Climate Justice Grants Act, introduced back in 2021, was one of the foundations for this critical program in the IRA that we're going to be talking about today. Next, I want to introduce Alexander Gallo who is the special advisor to the US EPA overseeing the environmental and climate justice community change grants. She brings several years of experience developing and implementing innovative models for community transformation, including at FEMA, the Federal Emergency Management Agency and the state of California. Alex Now, based in Washington, DC, is a first-generation college graduate with a bachelor's degree from California State University, Fresno, and grew up in California's Central Coast. Alexandra, we're so honored to have you here with us today. If you want to unmute and say a few things. Hi, everyone. Uh, the honor is all ours at EPA. We're so grateful that you all are convening this space, having important conversation. Um, I say it many times, this program that we'll speak on today would be nothing without all of you getting the word out, helping to support capacity um, and bridging all of the gaps across the country. So just thank you so much to Evergreen Action and all of the wonderful panelists today. 
Thank you, Alex. And then co-presenting with you today will also be Gabby Plotkin, a grant specialist at EPA. Gabby's on detail from the US EPA Region 5, based out of Chicago, to the Office of Environmental Justice and External Civil Rights. She focuses on grants, environmental policy, and community engagement. Gabby, if you want to say a few words, please unmute yourself. Thank you, Hannah. I'm really excited to join today. Um, and talk more about the community change grants. Awesome. Well, like I said, we're super happy to have you. Next, I would like to introduce Michelle Roos, who is the Executive Director of the Environmental Protection Network, an organization that serves as a trusted resource for environmental justice communities and other stakeholders seeking technical assistance and other support with EPA programs. Michelle has 20 five years of experience in project management and environmental protection. When she was formerly at EPA, she co-founded and co-managed the West Coast Collaborative, a public-private partnership to reduce emissions from diesel engines. She also led a national work group to better incorporate environmental justice into the federal environmental permitting process. Thank you so much for joining us, Michelle. And please feel free to unmute and say hello to everyone. Hello, thank you so much. Honor to be here. Great. And then last but certainly not least, we have Emmy Wang, who is the Director of Capacity Building at the Green Lining Institute. She supports under-resourced communities in California and beyond to access tools to lead their own transformations. As one example, she worked with local partners to facilitate a collaborative community-led effort in South Stockton to secure $35 million in green capital investments through California's Transformative Climate Communities Program. She's also a dedicated policy advocate and led the advocacy for SB 10, 1072, which created the Regional Climate Collaboratives Program to build capacity and technical assistance infrastructure in California's most vulnerable communities. I mean, great to see you. We're thrilled to have you here. Feel free to unmute and say hello. Cool. Uh, great to be here. Thanks for having me. Um, yeah, coming in from Oakland, a lonely land. I'm excited to talk about, about this big money and whether or not, you know, how to make sure uh, communities are best prepped for it. So I'll turn it back to you, Anna. Awesome. And we are so excited to get to all of your amazing presentations later. But first, we have Rep. Nanette Berrigan, who was unable to make it in person today, but kindly recorded a message for us. So we're going to kick things off with that. Hello, and thank you to Evergreen, the EPA, and the organizations that have put together this webinar to inform communities on how to access critical grant dollars through the Environmental and Climate Justice Block Grants Program. Historically, underserved communities hit first and worst by the climate crisis and pollution from fossil fuels have not been prioritized for federal resources to reduce pollution. I'm proud to have led efforts to secure unprecedented investments in the Inflation Reduction Act that will see billions of dollars in federal funds go directly to environmental justice communities. These block grants allow communities to propose their own locally led projects to lessen the impacts of climate change, reduce pollution, and advance environmental and climate justice. This is a rare opportunity to uplift communities of color and low-income communities. We cannot take it for granted. We want to get the word out that these grants exist, make it as easy as possible for communities to apply for this funding and to implement projects if they receive a grant. This webinar is so important. It is a way to break down barriers so nonprofits, tribes, and local governments closest to the people and the problems can lead the way to a sustainable future. I encourage you to take advantage of the flexibility provided through the program that will allow each community to create their own solutions to community problems instead of having the one-size-fits-all approach we've traditionally seen in federal programs. To support communities in applying for these grants, the EPA is also offering technical assistance for each stage of the community challenge grant process from application support, capacity building, project development, and beyond. It's part of the all of government approach by the Biden-Harris administration and Democrats in Congress to make sure these federal resources reach you and make a difference in the quality of life in your communities. 
I look forward to reading about the exciting projects that the Environmental and Climate Justice Block grant programs jumpstarts across the country. Thank you. Awesome. So again, thanks to Rebecca again for sending that in to help kick us off. But to move things along, as noted by Rep. Berrigan, this program is historic in so many ways, including the ways it allows communities to really drive the solutions that are best for them. Later, Michelle will talk more about technical assistance opportunities, and Emmy will share examples of the sort of projects that could be undertaken with this program. And of course, we're going to get to your questions. But before we do all of that, Alex and Gabby, I'm hoping you can explain a little bit more about what this program is about for those who might not know already. Great, thanks Hannah, and we appreciate that special message. Um, Gabby will be screen sharing a few slides for us today, so um, I'll have Gabby set that up. Still loading on my end. Great, uh, Hannah, can you confirm that? See everything, cool. Yep, we can see it all. Awesome. Well, thank you so much again. Um, we are honored to be here and speak to you all. We are very grateful for such a broad audience. Um, as mentioned, uh, we'll go over the community change grants, the environmental and climate justice community change grants, um, just to uh, dissuade any confusion. Um, uh, Inflation Reduction Act authorized the environmental climate justice uh, block grants. Um, since then, we've um, changed or adjusted the naming to the Environmental and Climate Justice Community Change Grants. Um, so all one and the same, but wanted to just clarify that today. Um, and we are very excited to walk through um, some of the key elements to know about the grants if you're interested in applying for them or learning about them or helping to do outreach. Um, just uh, sharing important um, things to take away. And then it sounds like we'll be diving into a great panel discussion. Uh, Gabby, can you move forward slides, please? Next slide, Gabby, is it progressing? Is it not going on your end? Um, it's still the main slide for me. Hannah, you as well? Mm -hmm. I think it's just slow, I'm sorry. <laughs> Um, but we're speaking about the goals now. <laughs> okay, well, uh, hopefully the slides will catch up with us. Um, uh, to pro provide some background context, oh, maybe Gabby will try again. Yeah, I'm going to try again, but go ahead. Okay, um, the slides will catch up with us, but in terms of the broad overview of the program, um, in 2022, President Biden signed into law the Inflation Reduction Act. Uh, this provided EPA with one time $3 billion in funding for grants, um, as well as uh, $200 million in technical assistance to benefit disadvantaged communities. Um, this is a uh, key um, because unlike some of the other programs out there federally, um, some of you may know about Justice 40, President um, Biden's initiative to allocate 40% of benefits to disadvantaged communities. Um, our program seeks to benefit all of it um, towards disadvantaged communities, uh, which is a term as, um, utilized by Congress within the Inflation Reduction Act. Um, I see we've got the slides up, so um, that's great. I think it's working now. Uh, so I, I also mentioned $200 million in technical assistance, as did Representative Barragon. Um, I also wanted to note that this program, or within the Inflation Reduction Act, it uniquely established new implementation authority for environmental justice at EPA, um, which was not necessarily present before. Um, and so with the $3 billion we had received through the Inflation Reduction Act, we've stood up several programs at EPA, which has uh, left us with $2 billion um, to develop our flagship Community Change Grants program. Uh, so we've developed the following goals based on input from the public as well as key stakeholders. Uh, the goals are to fund community-driven pollution and climate resilient solutions, invest in cross-sectoral partnerships that have a history of working in and with communities, 
uh, because these are short-term three-year grant terms, which I'll discuss, um, really looking for sustainability within these proposals um, with the goal of unlocking even further resources. Um, of course, uh, deliver on the TA that we've committed to and support capacity building um, and strengthen communities' decision-making powers. Next slide, please. Uh, we wanted to cover at a very high level our engagement efforts that led to the rollout of this program. Uh, we were met with a urgent need to, de uh, to deploy funds as quickly as possible across the country in order to meet our statutory requirements, um, which are very strict. Uh, but we also, of course, want to meet the longstanding needs of communities. Uh, so we took a few different steps over the last several months in developing this program. Uh, we received uh, public comments from over a thousand organizations across the country weighing in on every aspect of the program. Uh, we developed an Inflation Reduction Act accountability work group um, led by our National Environmental Justice Advisory Council um, representatives across the country who developed, co-developed with, with us a community change grants framework. Uh, got input from over 100 staff across EPA and all of the regions from air to water, hosted several listening sessions for unincorporated communities, tribes, uh, tribes in Alaska, territories, and more. Um, and so with that, we launched the uh, Notice of Funding Opportunity, NOFO for short, um, in November of 2023, which will remain open through November of 2024. More to discuss on that one. Next slide, please, Gabby. Um, and there are just a couple approaches that we wanted to highlight that came from that process, which has really def uh, defined how the program is developed today. Um, first, you'll see that the program takes a very holistic approach to community investment. Um, we wanted to develop a program that uniquely reflects the lived realities of people on the ground by uh, tackling multiple community priorities through a single investment. Um, this is very rare in terms of how federal investments are typically structured. Um, and we also tried to include several innovative grant making features um, and push back against doing things just because we've done them in the past. Um, and so Gabby will highlight um, some of those new changes at EPA. Next slide, please. Um, and overall, just wanted to show kind of how we envision this approach to community investment, um, a, a program that is focused, again, on tackling multiple priorities centered around the environment, the climate, people, and community. Next slide, please. Um, I know there's a lot of interest in technical assistance. Um, and so we have since developed the Community Change Technical Assistance Program, CCTA. Uh, based on feedback from stakeholders, there are several ways you can get in contact um, through pre uh, or sorry through submitting an online TA request form, um, calling a phone number or emailing the information there. Uh, we will be very honest uh, with you. Um, this program is still up and running uh, or up and trying to run. Um, we rolled out this program and have been building out the TA thereafter. So there is a bit of a backlog. Um, in terms of hearing back from folks, but it's something we're actively working on. Please feel free to email for follow-ups and we'll we'll try to be um, as proactive as we can in providing updates, but really encourage you all to get uh, set up with technical assistance and just know we're, we're working through some challenges there. Um, another opportunity though, is the Community Change Equitable Resilience TA we have. Um, this is specifically for communities that are disaster prone. Um, so there are different definitions you can take a look at, um, but this is a smaller pool of funds um, where we can support up to 50 communities nationally um, to do different scenario-based sort of design work um, for those who want to do infrastructure projects but are in some of those um, challenging um, disaster prone areas. And then finally, um, many of you may know about the Thriving Communities Technical Assistance Centers, the Tic Tacs, um, which are um, across the country. EPA stood them up uh, over the last year or so. Um, and these aren't uh, prepared to be able to provide direct um, application support, um, but they are there to answer broad questions and mostly provide outreach and support and can help you get connected to TA um, if, you're, if you're having some challenges. Next slide, please. 
Uh, something to be aware of within the notice of funding opportunity, as I mentioned earlier, um, all of the funds must benefit disadvantaged communities. Um, different agencies um, define benefits in different ways. Um, for us, for at least um, one of the tracks um, within the program that I'll discuss, uh, we really want to ensure that um, in benefits means where people live, where they are, funding is going directly to these areas. Um, so with that, you'll see that there are some mapping requirements that we'll be looking at to see where projects are, how a project intends to benefit a disadvantaged community. And then there are several ways to see whether or not um, the community you're with or um, representing qualifies as a disadvantaged community. Um, primarily through our EPA Inflation Reduction Act Disadvantaged Communities Mapping Tool. Um, for those of you familiar with other federal mapping tools, um, there's the EJ screen at EPA and then the CJS in the White House. Um, this mapping tool combines both of those. Um, so you can just use this tool for ease. Um, however, some communities might be smaller, um, such as disadvantaged unincorporated communities, and therefore may not show up on this mapping tool. Um, so please reference the funding opportunity for how you can potentially submit localized data um, for, for EPA review um, to see if your community can qualify as a disadvantaged community. Um, and lastly, there's a definition around farm working communities, um, which can qualify as disadvantaged as well. Um, so please keep in mind, um, must be a disadvantaged community uh, to apply for these funds. Next slide, please. And I'll actually um, be handing it over briefly to Gabby to cover some of our um, topics around eligibility, statutory partnerships and collaborating entities and how different orgs can come together to apply for our major grant. Thank you, Alex. And thank you everyone for bearing with me with te technical difficulties. Um, to highlight in particular which entities are eligible, um, we're looking at localized projects, as Alex said, focusing on um, geographically defined communities. And the pieces that go along with that um, are when submitting an application, for example, making sure that you comply with all the requirements we've put in the funding opportunity. So again, um, we encourage you to read that carefully, um, but I'll speak more now to the statutory partnership piece. Um, and then a few other things to note is just that uh, given the statute, um, the statutory language, all projects must be completed within three years. Um, and that's a hard deadline. Um, there will be no extensions. So as far as applying for the grant, our eligible entities start with a community-based nonprofit. Um, that will be at least one of uh, the two in our pair of the statutory partnership. Um, and as you can see on the right-hand side, there are multiple other entities that can partner with a CBO, a community-based organization, um, in order to fulfill the requirements. So we're really emphasizing collaboration here. Um, it could be with a fe federally recognized tribe, a local government, an institution of higher education, or another community-based organization. Um, we are asking for documentation to show that the uh, partnership is legitimate. And you can find information about what that looks like, again, in the NOFO. But uh, we just want to emphasize that given the high volume um, of funding we're seeing for these projects, it's really important that we think about collaborating. And that feeds into how it works in general in our process. So we have these two applicants, um, either the CBO or the other entity could be the lead applicant. Um, it's totally up to you depending on your project and who would like to take some of that greater uh, burden of reporting requirements and working directly with EPA. Um, but in general, we envision a collaboration among entities um, to be able to ensure such lar uh, large scale effectiveness and impact of these projects. So for example, when getting access to a site, um, you might need to be working with a state agency um, or working with um, a tribe, federally recognized or not, um, and to ensure that, this, um, that the goals of this project are able to be completed. So we really envision this kind of power sh sharing collaborative vision um, in order to ensure communities are at the center through our community-based organizations um, but that we are really involving the right partners to get work done. And I'll hand it back to Alex. 
All right, thanks, Gabby. Uh, we just wanted to highlight um, our target investment areas uh, for the program. Um, so we haven't gotten into it yet, which we will very briefly hear, but there are two tracks within the program that entities can apply for. Um, so this only applies to the first track focused on infrastructure and implementation. Um, but we're really excited and proud about these. Um, this is largely, um, almost entirely built off of the input that we heard through our request for information process. Um, so I won't go through each one in detail, but please take a look um, and share this in terms of your outreach and your partners um, to know that not only are we setting funds aside for these, but this means that uh, two communities of similarness can uh, compete against each other, uh, which uh, makes it uh, easier in terms of helping to level the playing field um, amongst organizations and communities with uh, similar characteristics. Next slide, please. Uh, so as Gabby had mentioned, um, or I had mentioned as well, uh, we have two tracks within the program. Uh, the first one, track one, is called Community Driven Investments for Change. As you can see, it is the largest share and really the primary feature of the community change grants. Um, we anticipate making 150 wards nationally, approximately um, at 10 to $20 million each. Um, so these are really large scale projects, um, different types of projects, several partners working together over three years to uh, implement um, their, uh, their vision for community change. Um, but we also uh, wanted to pilot something a little bit different and new focused on meaningful engagement for equitable governance. So we anticipate making about 20 awards nationally in the one to $3 million range. Um, and this is really focused um, for those communities um, who might not be at the place where they are working with their local government um, or other types of um, governments in a way that they need to, to create that community level change. Um, and so this is really designed to break down barriers um, and, and collaborate toward more equitable processes. Next slide, please. Uh, to walk through uh, track one, community driven investments for change, um, that holistic, uh, comprehensive approach image we showed earlier, focusing on people, partnerships, um, the environment. Uh, this is really um, mostly encompassed within track one. Um, so essentially, uh, communities and applicants and partners can come together and implement a variety of different project types. Um, it is required to select from at least one climate action and one pollution reduction strategy. Um, these are meant to serve as um, a broader sort of themes in, in terms of types of projects. Um, but you'll notice within the funding opportunity in the appendix, there are several different project types. Um, and these are really intended to be flexibly designed by communities to meet the overall goal of the intended strategy, um, but can really include several different types of projects. Um, it's just up to the applicant to make that case. Um, but within climate action, we have everything from green infrastructure and nature-based solutions to community resilience hubs, um, waste reduction and management, microgrid installation, uh, pollution reduction, indoor and outdoor air quality, clean water infrastructure, and hazardous waste management. Uh, we do require a community engagement and collaborative governance plan um, that shows how different partners um, who are involved in the grant will work together and with community to implement over the three-year grant term. And we also require a community strength plan um, which uh, should include strategies and activities that will help ensure that the uh, people within the community will benefit economically from the funds and then also to avoid any potential um, displacement um, as a result of these investments. Next slide, please. And Gabby, I'm going to go ahead and just go over these briefly, just for the sake of the group's time. Um, so for track two, meaningful engagement for equitable governance. Um, again, these are focused on um, creating transparency and accountability within government, um, getting communities to a place where they can work with their governments to break down barriers. Um, and so that government can really change the way that they are working with the community to have more equitable outcomes. Um, so different project examples might include the development of zoning boards, um, advisory boards for public utilities. Um, this, this idea around advisory boards is really uh, came as inspiration from our National Environmental Justice Advisory Council, um, but can be really shaped locally depending on what the needs are. 
um, can also support direct participation of disadvantaged communities in the development of policies and solutions. Um, and it's also focused on um, participatory budgeting, um, bringing community voice directly into uh, the, the development of different projects. Next slide, please. Uh, as mentioned, we've integrated several innovations as part of the program. Um, so the program will be open for one year. We'll accept and review applications on a rolling basis. There's an opportunity for oral presentation from community members. Um, and for those who are unsuccessful their first time in applying, they can resubmit their application um, again, um, as long as it is revised and you receive a debriefing from EPA. Next slide, please. Um, there's uh, several ways that you can stay updated with us. Um, you will know that we uh, EPA tends to host several NOFO modifications um, online for all of the different funding opportunities, but I want you to know that this doesn't mean we are changing anything substantively within the program, but simply means we are providing clarification based on input from uh, different organizations throughout the applying process. Um, so if you see that there is a modification incoming, please just continue with preparing your applications, keep an eye out for it, but um, I wouldn't pause your work um, because we only have the funds until they're all um, uh, allocated. So please continue applying. And there are several ways that you can stay in touch with us. Next slide, please. Um, so with that, um, I just wanted to hand it over quickly to the team because I know we had some technical difficulties there at first. Um, but again, I wanted to, uh, on behalf of Gabby and I and EPA, um, thank Evergreen Action for bringing this together. Um, I just wanted to highlight a couple of things briefly. Um, this is not only a historic moment in terms of $2 billion available um, to, to go directly to communities, community organizations, um, but there are several takeaways in terms of what we've included within this program that is historic, that we've set aside funds for communities who have never been highlighted in funding programs, um, seldom acknowledged even um, in terms of uh, nationwide uh, federal programming. Uh, we've included several safeguards to ensure that these are driven by and for community through collaborative governance, um, calling out unintended consequences of displacement. Um, this is the broadest approach to infrastructure investments that we've ever seen at the federal level in terms of all the different types of projects that can be fund, funded. And of course, this new feature on large scale, meaningful, equitable governance. Um, so I just wanted to share that with you. Hope that you all can amplify um, these important and new components um, of a federal program. Um, and we're really excited at EPA to see what comes of this. Thank you all. Awesome. Thank you, Alex and Gabby, so much for that kind of high level overview of this just incredible program. And I know we've got some folks with questions. I promise we will get to them towards the end. But Emmy, I know a lot of folks in our audience are wanting to know what sorts of programs might be a good use of these funds. And I'm wondering what you can share from your own experience and what you know of other communities that are considering this program. Oh, thanks, Hannah, and thanks, Alex, for that great overview of the grant itself. Um, yeah, so my name is Emmy Wang. I'm with an organization called the Green Lending Institute. We're a policy and advocacy racial justice organization. Um, and my team in particular works with many communities across California, um, many of whom are eyeing this grant because of the kind of flexible and holistic nature. So um, hopefully I'm going to I'm going to share some examples of like projects that we think could be eligible from our network and hopefully that provides yeah just a little bit of like grounding and inspiration from you all it sounds like yeah in the chat there's a lot, lot of great project ideas already so let me go ahead and share my screen um okay so here we are this is overview right alex talked about this there are two tracks for the epa grant that's track one and there's track two track one these are those big kind of catalytic um dollars 10 to 20 million dollars grants each primarily for pollution reduction um, and climate action. So just a little bit of overview here. And again, Alex went over this. This is what we, you know, as I read the guidelines, as I understand what this program is about, um, really, these are the two kind of core, uh, I would say, substantive content pieces of this grant. Uh, applicants will have to choose at least one climate action strategy. And you can see here, there's an array of different kinds of strategies from waste reduction and management, green infrastructure, electrification, active transportation, an array of like climate action strategies. Um, and then two, pollution reduction strategies. So indoor and outdoor air quality, clean water infrastructure, and hazardous waste management. 
those are the two kind of overarching buckets of track one. And within them, I think there's a, you know, a high degree of flexibility for groups to, yeah, develop projects that meet community needs and that really arise from the ground up. So here, I'm just gonna talk a little bit about a project um, that we have uh, opportunity uh, to work with here at Greenlining. So um, yeah, I'm gonna share some project examples that I know kind of most deeply, but there's a wide array of examples. And so I just wanna kind of disclaimer at the top. Um, I think there's a lot of ways to go about this grant. So this is just kind of one example. Um, we are working with some partners in Pomona, California, um, who are thinking about an array of kind of holistic integrated investments. Um, they've had some legwork under them. So they've received a California planning grant in the last, I would say, maybe three, three or four years ago, um, which allowed them to have some funded time to do community needs assessment, community level planning, and to really identify what are the needs as identified from community. Uh, from that, they really identified um, a couple key priorities. Energy efficiency is one, uh, transportation, uh, both electrification, and then also just like active transportation and um, really meeting the mobility needs of the neighborhood as another. Um, and then also re reducing, um, increasing public health impacts as another, another core goal. So that's the project that they've been working on. And then as we kind of understood what EPA was offering. Um, yeah, we were really excited about this grant because we think it gives us, um, it gives us the opportunity to meet a lot of those things that I just mentioned. So to thread in, this is a picture here of a farm called Lopez Urban Farm in Pomona, uh, urban agriculture program, growing fresh produce for the community and also taking down, you know, reducing greenhouse gases. Um, and then thinking how to thread this project in with some of those active transportation projects, as well as some of those energy efficiency projects. Um, so yeah, this group of, of partners, they're, they're kind of eyeing the grant right now, kind of seeing where it's gonna go, but that's this it's serving as the route for um, the proposal that they are going to seek to submit. Um, so the two content areas, climate action and pollution reduction, I think they feel um, yeah, excited to be able to tackle through this grant. Um, and then in terms of kind of the equity components of the grant, um, grounded by community, involving residents, having a collaborative governance structure, um, those are also all things that the group um, and the collaborative is, is considering. And you can see on the photo on the right, um, some of the folks who are engaged from multiple different organizations. So that's an example of track one. I think, again, there are many different ways to go about it, but at least one example that I'm that I'm most familiar with. Um, and then quickly moving on to track two as a refresher, right? This is those um, smaller grants, meaningful engagement for equitable governance, grants of one to three million dollars each. And again, a refresher on what this is, giving disadvantaged communities a meeting her voice in government decision-making processes, some examples, educational and training programs, advisory boards, collaborative governance activities, uh, participatory budgeting. Um, and here is another project example that's kind of near and dear to our hearts. Um, we help to convene a community of practice. So this is an ongoing um, peer learning network um, that's actually quite large geographically in scope. So we, we operate in five different states um, and then bring those states together to uh, learn about peer share and then, um, yeah, understand what governmental processes are impacting them in the realm of equitable electrification. So this is some of the cohort at uh, a recent convening we had in the fall. Um, and yeah, again, for track two, we kind of looked at the track two application and it seemed again, flexible enough to be able to um, continue and resource our activities around uh, monthly workshops, webinars, peer learning, and then also identifying what are the state and federal uh, governmental processes that are impacting our neighborhoods and our communities, and what would it look like to better engage in those governmental processes, making sure that policies, budget decisions, allocations, um, that that is meeting community-identified need. So that's the example here. Um, again, just one example of many. I don't think you, you definitely do not need a, a large geographic scope like we have. Um, I think it's the grant is really just asking for, yeah, how to better root governmental policymaking and decision-making directly in impacted communities' experiences. So I will stop there and um, stop sharing screen. And hopefully that was helpful to give, you know, a little bit of grounding and I can pass it on back to Evergreen and to Hannah. Thank you. Thank you so much, Emmy. And I, I for one, found that super helpful, just getting some ideas about what type of projects are out there. And also, it's just exciting to hear about what other people are thinking about and doing and creating change in their communities. I love all of it. 
Um, and hopefully we can start helping some folks do that as well. So Michelle, to kick it over to you, we have to talk about technical assistance. Some of our speakers have talked about how EPA is providing technical assistance for this program, but I know folks are wondering how to access that and what it specifically can help with. So can you talk to us about what assistance options are out there for communities wanting to get their hands on these funds? Sure, absolutely. And um, Hannah, can you see my screen okay? My yep, that's good. Excellent. We'll s trying to trying to use some new technology. Uh, but yes, I'm Michelle Roos, again, the Executive Director of the Environmental Protection Network. Just to explain, uh, you got great people on this call. Um, do keep asking questions and folks will get answers to you. We are a 501c3 nonprofit, although we are... Um, uh, partners with many of the Tic Tacs, as was mentioned in EPA's presentation, nothing that I'm about to share with you or nothing I'm about to say is anything that is funded um, from EPA. Um, but just a little bit of background on our organization. Uh, so we were founded in 2017. We have over 600 volunteers, most of whom worked for EPA, including me, who ran a national grant program. Um, our goal is to build the capacity of environmental agencies and the communities they serve on, we do that in a variety of ways through national environmental policy, pro bono technical assistance, mentoring, and recruiting folks to work at EPA, um, and educating Congress, and being a resource to press and other NGOs. Most important for today is our technical assistance program. So we have a pro bono technical assistance program. We now have 10, uh, pardon me, 11 full-time staff across the country whose sole goal it is is to connect communities, disadvantaged communities with EPA alum, former engineers, scientists, lawyers. Our goal is to support frontline communities as well as NGOs um, and under-resourced state, local, and tribal agencies. So basically, if you think about the eligible applicants and statutory partners for this grant opportunity, those are the folks that we are tasked with supporting day in and day out. We help folks navigate bureaucracies, um, regulations, access funding opportunities such as this. Um, and to date, in just the last two and a half years, we've connected over um, 160 of our volunteers on over 650 um, requests for technical assistance. Um, so as was mentioned earlier, EPA received $200 million to provide technical assistance to help support folks preparing um, for federal funding, including community change grants. As was also mentioned, there are two different kinds. Okay, so um, this presentation can definitely be shared and we can post it on our website as well as Evergreen can um, uh, share it, no problem. Um, this first kind of assistance are these community change technical assistance grants that EPA mentioned. Um, my colleague Rudy will put in the chat a link to the Community Change Technical Assistance website, which you can go on to, and I would recommend you do all three of these things. One, sign up for their newsletter. Two, join their weekly webinars. Every single Tuesday afternoon Eastern time, they have a webinar where they go over, let's say, eligibility or um, technical assistance questions. Um, these are super duper helpful webinars that I would definitely recommend that you do. You can also request that one-on-one -on -one assistance, again, with the caveat that EPA mentioned earlier, that um, that assistance, that one-on-one -on -one assistance isn't available today, but we'll get to how EPN um, can help with that. The other kind of assistance, um, so that assistance that I just mentioned is really to help folks pull together an application and help folks manage a grant should they get it. The second kind of assistance is much more intensive and comprehensive. It is only being offered to 50 recipients nationwide. There's a form that my colleague Rudy will put in the chat that you can request this kind of assistance if you believe that you are a disadvantaged community in a disaster prone area, go ahead and apply for this assistance. This is climate resilience projects. It could conclude a focus on green infrastructure, open spaces, intense heat islands, wildfires, floods, et cetera. And it includes all sorts of support 
um, including um, phone calls, one day visits, six weeks of design and community engagement work. It's a very, very comprehensive assistance. And again, um, very competitive to get that assistance. Um, so those are the two basic kinds of EPA paid for assistance. And again, highly recommend you do both. EPN, right now, our organization, our 501c3, has other kinds of assistance. Um, so the big kind of assistance that I would recommend you begin with is clicking on these six-step application processes for EPA's community change grants. If you Google Environmental Protection Network, this is on our homepage. Um, I think you guys can see this. This is the kind of assistance. It's very, very comprehensive. Ignore the due dates. That's for folks that wanted to get an application by February. These will be changed um, within a day or two. But basically, it takes you through, okay, what do you do first? Oh, you got to register for SAM.gov, grants.gov. You know, what are all the things that you're going to need for your application process? Where's there a summary of this application? Um, what kinds of partner resources? This is actually a question in the chat. Hey, I'm looking for partners. You can fill out this partner survey and look for potential partners. Um, so it takes you step by step through the entire process about um, looking at the evaluation criteria, submitting all the forms you need to submit. It gets kind of like just makes it as easy as possible, considering this is a very comprehensive and complicated um, federal grant program. Um, whoops, I went too fast. There we go. Um, as I mentioned, we have that partner assistance survey. The other thing that we do, um, and I can't remember, recall if EPA mentioned this, but every applicant will need to register on SAM.gov and grants.gov, not only to receive this money, but even to apply for this money. Um, so we host office hours every other Wednesday. You can follow this link that my colleague Rudy will put in the chat um, to sign up for those. The other thing, and this might be extremely important for right now, whoops, moving very fast here, um, is we can offer one-on-one -on -one support, um, especially during this time that EPAs, contractors are getting ready um, to give one-on-one -on -one support, we can offer one-on-one -on -one support. And Rudy will put in the chat our email address, info at environmentalprotectionnetwork.org. So now, now I was so good at going ahead, there you go. So what next steps would I take if I were you? Number one, go to these two kinds of technical assistance that EPA is providing and request that if you're interested. Number two, do all three of those um, resources that I mentioned that EPN provides, read through the application processes, fill out the partner assistance survey, sign up for SAM.gov registration office hours if you haven't already, um, and please email us directly you have any specific questions regarding a community change grant application. Thank you. Awesome, thank you so much, Michelle. I just love all of the resources EPN has put together around this. It makes the process as clear as it can be because obviously applying for these grants is no small task, but again, thank you so much and now, the time we have left, I would love to get to some of the audience's questions. So to kick things off, I'm not sure if maybe Alex or Gabby would want to answer this, but um, we have a question about how will the funds be made available? Are there rolling deadlines for submission prior to November 2024? Great. Thanks, Hannah. Um, thanks, everyone, for those great presentations. I just want to provide high level. Um, uh, we are very grateful to present on EPA today. Um, the folks here also presented on different ideas from their organization. So just want to share that um, uh, from the outset. Um, but the uh, funding opportunity is open and available now. Um, so it was launched on November uh, of 2023, and we are accepting applications now um, and every single day until November of 2024. Um, so uh, please keep that in mind. Um, we will be reviewing as they come in. Um, we are, uh, we'll also let you all know um, where you stand in terms of that application process, but we are not waiting until the end of 2024 to make awards. Um, we are uh, reviewing them now and we're trying to get funds out as quickly as possible. So does that answer, Hannah? Yes, and just to add on to that, 
Um, is it possible to start work in 2025 and finish in two years or is really these need to get going in 2024? Um, no. So, um, yeah, as part of the application uh, review process and what you all will notice in the funding opportunity um, evaluation and scoring criteria, we are seeking applications that are ready to implement um, as soon as possible. Um, so uh, you all can develop your work plans, kind of set when ideally you want to get work going, um, but we need to um, get these funds out as quickly as possible. Um, and also um, uh, all funds must be um, uh, uh, contributing to someone um, by uh, 2026. Um, so we are looking for those who are ready to go. And also for track one, that includes shovel ready projects. Um, so uh, yeah, all of those um, things considered will need these to be three-year grants starting as soon as um, the applicant is selected and able to implement their work. Great. Thank you so much. And quickly, while we still have you, Alex, can you just review eligibility again? I think we have some folks that were a bit confused by the slide that was talking about the $50 million for unincorporated areas. Um, mm -hmm. I think if you can just clear that up a little bit. Yeah, so um, there's a couple different components when it comes to eligibility. Um, some of them was included in the Inflation Reduction Act statute. Um, so those are um, the eligible entities. So the community-based nonprofit organizations, which we have a definition of that in our NOFO, um, just to let everyone know, it uh, you do not have to be a 501c3. We get that question often. Um, higher education institution, tribal or uh, federally recognized tribe, um, and local government. Um, so those are all of the eligible entities. Uh, first piece of um, what is required per the statute. The second piece of what is required per the statute is that two entities, including at least one CBO, must enter into a statutory partnership. Um, so that's the second piece of what is required. Um, and uh, the lead applicant does not have to be the CBO, but it can be. Uh, the third piece of what is required within the statute for eligibility is that you must be a disadvantaged community. And so EPA has defined what that means, um, that you can identify that through the mapping tools that we've discussed um, through meeting definition for a farm working community or by being a disadvantaged unincorporated community um, by following some of the guidelines that we have within our funding opportunity. So we don't explicitly define that community, except to say that we will be looking at localized data um, if a community is, does not show up, show up automatically on our mapping tool as disadvantaged already. Um, so those are really the main three baseline eligibility requirements that you need to know. Does that help? That's super helpful. Thank you so much, Alex. Um, Michelle, I feel like you might be able to speak to this next question well, but um, somebody asked if EPA would be able to provide a list of projects or participants in the same region. And from my understanding, I don't think that's necessarily something EPA would provide, but I know you all um, have your CBO nonprofit um, list. I don't know if you can speak a little bit more to that, because I think that's what folks are wondering about. How can they get connected with other CBOs? Yeah, no problem. Again, not that our list is massively thorough. It's as only as good as people use it. So Rudy will put again in the chat a link to our partner survey. Um, and folks can fill that out and say they're looking for a certain kind of partner. And then you can publicly view all the folks that have signed on to that. Um, the other thing that you can do is email us at info at environmentalprotectionnetwork.org. Tell us a little bit about what you're looking for, and we can also help you search for somebody. Again, as a 501c3, not as an agent of EPA. Great. Thank you so much for that. Um, Gabby, I feel like this might be a good question for you, but somebody had asked um, if fiduciaries can be used. Can you share a little bit of light on that? Yes, so um, thank you everyone for the questions. Um, just to clarify on its head, I can't necessarily answer exactly what the particular situation is, but at EPA, we generally respond that um, we don't recognize fiscal sponsorships in terms of um, entities. If you have a particular organization that you're looking at, um, trying to determine whether it is a community-based organization or not, 
please feel free to email us and I can drop our email in the chat as well, um, just to give us more information about what you're looking at so we can determine if it fills, fulfills the criteria. I also just wanted to say I saw some language in the chat around um, what a community-based organization is um, and just encourage everyone to read our NOFO to find that information. Um, it doesn't necessarily have to have 501c3 status. Thanks. Awesome. Thank you so much for that, Gabby. And actually, another question that I think you might be able to help us with is to prove that partnerships are legitimate, do applicants need an MOU? So I think the person there is talking about a memorandum of understanding. Um, and again, in our NOFO, I would um, point this person to um, our appendix. Oh, I just had it pulled up. Yeah, um, I can be um, so appendix B, our partnership agreement between the lead applicant and a statutory partner. Um, so to uh, answer the question, um, a memorandum of understanding um, is not necessarily a legally binding um, uh, item. Um, and so for that reason, we do not require MOUs. Again, the statute requires a partnership uh, or a statutory partnership, which um, uh, legally, it would be a partnership agreement, um, but that really depends um, on the local jurisdiction, for example. Um, so th those definitions really depend based on the, you know, is it a county, city, um, tribal government, things like that. And so it just needs to be legally binding. And then different um, entities have different ways um, in terms of uh, how something is legally binding. Um, so Partnership B kind of provides a lot more um, examples of what that might look like, um, but no, an MOU um, is not required. Awesome. Thank you so much for that. And I think probably one last question for the EPA folks, regarding the statutory authority, does that only demonstrate the formal partnership in place or is there a specific function they are expected to fill? Um, the statutory partnership um, to just to be eligible for the grant is only that legal legally binding partnership. Um, so it's like straight eligibility. Of course, from there on, we're looking at the meaningfulness of those partnerships and the scoring and evaluation criteria, but that is separate from just who is eligible to apply. Great. And then I think probably last question, because we're just about out of time. I know time time flies when you're having fun, but um, we have someone that was asking about um, refugees settled in the U.S. and if they would be considered disadvantaged unincorporated community? Um, we don't um, have refugees specifically outlined in our funding opportunity. Um, uh, whether or not uh, refugees live in an unincorporated community is different. So um, again, just um, focusing on, we have a pretty broad definition for what encompasses a disadvantaged unincorporated community. Um, they um, lack um, a, a a specific type of governmental function. Um, so that is really the, the piece there that we're looking at for unincorporated communities. Um, and then just looking at some localized data to see, you know, uh, how many people live there, things like that, if they are not on the mapping tool. So that's kind of separate in terms of the other um, statuses um, and identities within the community. Awesome, well, thank you so much. Everyone for joining us. Thank you, Emmy, Michelle, Gabby, and Alex for partnering with us to get this information out there about this just incredible climate investment. I also want to once again thank Rep Berrigan for kicking us off earlier. And finally, thank you to our audience for coming out and listening to us today. If you want to learn more about this program, we've dropped several important links in the chat, but we'll also be sending a follow-up email that includes all the additional resources we've talked about. You can also find a recording of this conversation at any time on Evergreen's YouTube page. And please feel free to share it with folks who you think might be interested, but weren't able to attend today. And as far, I think we're at five o'clock. So that is the end for us. But if you have more questions, feel free to send them in to us. Be on the lookout for that follow-up email. And again, thank you all so much for being here today.